Hey Bethel Church, thanks for joining us today. I'm Pastor Rich and I serve as your Faith at Home pastor. Bethel is organizing a team to go to Ensenada, Mexico this fall. I will be there for a full week uh, building a house for a family in need and serving the community and sharing the gospel uh, alongside some local churches. The dates are September 30th through October 7th. This trip has been happening uh, for over a decade. And over the last few years, we've grown uh, really close with a couple of churches down there and have ministered alongside them. So you may remember when Pastor Ricardo and his wife Antonio visited Bethel a couple of years ago. Uh, Pastor Ricardo preached on Sunday morning and he gathered with other groups and he's leading the church in Ensenada. So it was fun to have them here and we get to go back and be a part of their ministry. So this trip is for everyone. As for building a house, you may go, I don't have the skills, but if you can hold a paintbrush, uh, we'd love to have you join us. It is a great trip. Also, summer time is here. Uh, preschool VBS, sports camp and day camp are scheduled and uh, you can register. You can do that online or through our website as well. Hey, we've been hearing a lot about construction in Fergus Falls uh, and the finished classrooms in Budamasa Chad. But you may ask, what's going on in Battle Lake? Last fall, Bethel voted to sign a build to suit lease agreement with a developer. So what's been going on since then? Well, the Battle Lake Property Committee has been working ahead with the developer and the builder on a design for the building. Uh, they're getting down to like close final details on like where electrical outlets go and so they're getting really close to final design. This means that the contractor will start moving forward with construction very soon. As these details come together, we hope to set a day for a groundbreaking uh, in the very near future. So uh, we're looking forward to making room in order to make a difference in uh, people's lives in our community, in Fergus Falls, in Battle Lake, and Budamasa Chad. Uh, you can learn more about uh, these opportunities on our website and follow uh, that progress along there. Hey, thanks again for joining us online. Uh, this month of June, we're gonna be bringing in some guest speakers and we enter into a sermon series that we call Vantage Point, looking at the gospel from different people's perspective, all based and grounded in God's words. These sermons will be recorded on Sunday morning and will be shared online in the coming weeks. This morning, we're gonna get a chance to hear a sermon from Pastor Kevin recorded from a couple of years ago, uh, diving into 2 Timothy. We love crowns, don't we? As humble as we may try to be, there is in all of us a desire to be recognized for a job well done. To different degrees, we love winning and all that comes with it, the trophy, the praise, the diploma, and on and on. And as I am saying that, I am in no way saying that awards and things like that are a bad thing, not at all. However, like any good thing, any good thing, when these crowns become our all-consuming passion, and when they start to shape our identity, our worth, and our value, then the warning bell needs to be sounded. We love crowns. We especially love when our team is crowned champion in whatever sport that may be. Yes, some of you know, I'm a Yankee fan. Wow, you're gracious. I mean, laughs instead of booze. It's a beautiful thing. But you know, as a fan of the New York Yankees, I've had the chance to watch us be crowned champion a few times. In fact, in total, and I wasn't able to watch all of them, not that old, but uh, 27 World Series championships. Now, how fun, Twins fans, would it be to return to the excitement experienced in 1991 when they were crowned World Series champions? I will never forget, as you will never forget, Kirby Puckett's dramatic walk-off home run in extra innings in Game 6, right? That kept hopes alive. And he made an incredible catch. He also drove in some more runs. It was a big game for Kirby Puckett. But after that game, the ball was then placed in the hands of 18-game winner Jack Morris. And he went against John Smoltz in one of the most greatest pitching duels in all of World Series history. 
And in that extra inning game, the Twins, as you know, won one to nothing. And here's the deal, though. Jack Morris pitched 10 innings. I mean, that's unheard of in today's age. I mean, that just doesn't happen anymore. Pitchers don't go that long. But he pitched brilliantly. And one of the things that happened in the ninth inning was when Jack Morris came into the dugout after pitching the ninth, manager Tom Kelly kind of went up to him and there was a conversation that started to happen and basically manager Tom Kelly was telling Morris that he was done. I had to smile in an interview with Sports Illustrated. Twins outfielder Randy Bush asked, I want to know one thing. Who was going to take Morris out of this game? I mean, who would have had the courage to say, Jack, you're done? I don't think anyone would have done it. If it was Tom Kelly, Jack would have punched him, kicked him. He might have killed him. I just love that. But that was the scene. And he went on to, to finish that game as they won that World Series championship. Last Sunday... My son, Nick, graduated from Hillcrest. As we were all seated in the Student Activity Center at Hillcrest for the baccalaureate service and commencement, I found myself sitting between two groups of people. To my right were the Hillcrest seniors, all full of excitement and, and ready to graduate. And to my left were the golden alumni, the class of 1969. And I, I remember just kind of sitting there looking at both groups, and, and as, I, as I looked at those golden alumni, many of which I knew, I couldn't help but think of how so many of them have had the chance and had the opportunity to hand off the faith to younger men and women. They have done so in the past, and they are continuing to do that to this day, many of them. On Saturday night of that grad weekend, a senior class night, every senior was given words of encouragement and, and blessing. Many awards were given to students for a variety of, of accomplishments. They received crowns that night. Those crowns came in the form of trophies, scholarships, certificates, and during that evening, we were reminded of the words we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever you know it's it's that crown that we love to make much about here at Bethel as we announce and declare each and every week the glorious finished work of Jesus Christ and what that means for each and every one of us as his people in today's passage in 2nd Timothy chapter 4 I invite you to turn there the Apostle Paul is coming to the end of his earthly race, and he is passing the baton to young Timothy. I'd like to read verses 6 through 8 of 2 Timothy chapter 4. If you are able to stand for the reading of God's Word, I invite you to. Paul says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Father, these are your words to us, words we need to hear, words we need to be reminded of. Maybe words that we are familiar with, but Lord, just drill them deep down into our hearts, into our minds. They are a gift to us. They are life-giving, and we thank you for them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
You know, there are, there are five crown references in the New Testament that we read and discover. There's the imperishable crown. There's the crown of glory. There's the crown of life. The crown of rejoicing. And as we've read here this morning, the crown of, of righteousness. In our text today, Paul speaks of the crown of righteousness. And so I want us to just look briefly at this crown of righteousness. And as we do so, we will see what's so unique about it, who's it for, and how we get it. What's so unique about it? The crown of righteousness that Paul is referring to here in our text is an otherworldly crown. It's from above. It's different from so many of the other crowns that we alluded to earlier. These crowns, these trophies, these championships, and on and on. Again, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25, we see that it's also an imperishable crown. It's a crown that will last forever. Paul said they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. What a crown. Again, many of us just attended a lot of graduation parties. I can see it on your faces. I can see the exhaustion and all of that. We've been jumping around to different families, homes, and places to celebrate what these students have accomplished there were pictures that took us down memory lane as it related to that graduate. There were trophies, medals, there were certificates of achievement, all good things. But we all know that those awards and trophies and medals, they're going to collect dust. Eventually they're going to find their way into a box and then into one of our storage rooms to be stored away. And as I was thinking about that, I couldn't help but think of Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, where we read, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This crown that Paul is referring to here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, it's a symbol of victory. In Scripture, we find a, a ruling crown, right? The, the crown of royalty, of, of kings, people in authority. It's in Greek, diademu. There's also the victor's crown. Stephanos. This Greek word Stephanos was actually the winners and the victors that would wear these, these wreaths around their heads after winning events in the Greek athletic games. What else is unique about this crown? It's awarded by Jesus, the righteous judge, on that day. In our text here this morning, that day is in reference to the day that Jesus Christ returns. And what a scene that will be. At this point, you may be thinking, well, who's it for? Paul says in verse 8 that it's laid up and in store for him and all who have longed for his appearing. It's for Paul. Again, as Paul is writing this, we've got to remember he's... He says it here, verse 6, I mean, he's about to die. Paul is at the end of his life. He's in, an, in a prison. He's in a hole. He's in a prison that would make our worst prisons look like nothing. He's going through a lot of hardship and difficulty in that scene. But in that moment, he is looking back, and he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 
You know, these words of Paul reminded me of the words he shared with the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, where he says, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only, here's what he says, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Hmm. This crown of righteousness it's for those who Jesus describes in John 5, 24, when he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. It's for those who are justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. If these words describe you, if this is you, and if you find yourself this morning longing for Christ's appearing, O oh Lord, come, then this crown of righteousness will be awarded you as well. It's a gift. Did you notice Paul saying that this crown of righteousness is laid up and in store for him? I love that. It's kind of something we can kind of just read over and miss here. But I don't want us to. Paul is saying that this this crown that is laid up and in store, that, that has his name on it, it's a, it's a sure thing. For those who have been saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ. You know, a question of self-examination that I've asked myself on numerous occasions is this. Is what the Bible reveals about my assured future shaping the way I live today? C.S. Lewis said that if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this world, precisely because we cannot predict the moment we must be ready at all moments. Is that you this morning? It's my prayer that it is. Dr. Tony Evans said there was a show I used to watch a couple of years ago called The, the Early Edition. The host of the show would get the next day's newspaper, read it, and then do a show about the upcoming news. He read a newspaper about tomorrow and related it to his viewers today. And because he had tomorrow's newspaper today, he had information nobody else did. And he would use this knowledge to prevent terrible events every day. You know, most of our coworkers don't have the information. Most of our neighbors don't have the information. But as Christians, you and I, we have got an early edition. God has given us, in his word, the early edition we can function today in light of what we know about God's plan for the future. Finally, how do we get it? How do we get it? Grace. Grace. You know, to be awarded this crown, we have to first be in the race that Paul spoke of. And that's a question that is so important for us here at Bethel as it relates to all of you. We pray that you are in the race. That you have believed in Jesus Christ and his finished work. 
Because that's what is needed for you to be in the race. We receive this crown of righteousness because of the righteousness of Christ. If this was riding on our righteousness, on my righteousness, on your righteousness, we would have no hope. We would not have the the confidence and the assurance that we, we see here from Paul as he says what he says. His confidence is unmistakable about the work of Christ in his life and those he is writing to. In Philippians 1.6, Paul says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I mean, Paul saw his need for Jesus from the very beginning through the the middle journey part of his life as well, that need, that great need that was back here was still here and still there at the end. We can't help but read Paul and see of his great need for the gospel of grace, for the work of Jesus Christ in his life. Jerry Bridges writes, the same apostle who said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, also said in another context, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Hmm. Paul attributed all of his endurance, all of his faithfulness to the grace of God. And so we look at our responsibility, keep in mind that we are enabled to fulfill that responsibility only by the grace of God. Of God he says now the grace of God is often misunderstood he says I I think one of the most common misunderstandings of the grace of God is God's cutting me some slack grace is God's letting me get away with a few things that's the furthest thought from the grace of God the grace of God comes to us through Jesus Christ as a result of his sinless life and his sin-bearing death for us. But that grace is more than just God's kindness and benevolent feeling toward us. The grace of God is dynamic. The grace of God is God in action for our good, for your good. And so when the Apostle Paul said, by the grace of God I am what I am, He was speaking about the empowering of the Holy Spirit that God and His grace applies to each of us as we seek to live for Him. As we run the race, as we fight the good fight. So keep in mind as we look at our responsibilities, that we can carry out those responsibilities, again, only by the grace of God. In the words of John Newton in his beloved hymn, Amazing Grace, "'Tis grace has brought me safe thus far." And say the rest with me, and grace will lead me home. At the end of the day, when all is said and done, we attribute our faithfulness to the grace of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Oh Lord, how we need you. We need you. We need you every hour. We confess this need to you this morning. Father, if we find ourselves not believing that we have this great need for you. Oh, help us to see that. And at the time, at the same time, see your great grace and love for us. What you have made possible, salvation, life, this crown of righteousness. What a gift. 
Lord, we need you. You're our one defense, our righteousness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Bethel friends, thanks again for joining us today. I encourage you to process what you heard today, either with your family or maybe a small group or the people that you're gathered with. It's good to gather with other people and dig into God's word. You're also encouraged to participate in the mission of our church. You can do so by giving through our website or in the mobile app or by old school mail. And we'd love to have your support. Hey, your giving, Bethel, is making a huge difference on the lives of other people around us. And as we're making room, uh, we're making a difference here in Fergus Falls, in Battle Lake, and in Budamasa. So thank you for your giving. It makes it possible. Thanks so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again next week. God bless.